Excuse us. No, pardon me, ma'am. Sorry, sorry. Just move it, asshole. Oh, thank God. We got good seats. Damn right we did. Okay, so, we got the drink. We got the popcorn. And the candy. I think we're ready, man. This shit better be good. Let's hope so. Shh. The movie's starting. Good evening. I am Dustin Goes to Hollywood. I'm um, Mally Moore. And this is the Silver Linings Playlist, a podcast that tries to find the silver lining in some of cinema's bleakest endings. Tonight, on the program, we're talking network. Uh, a movie are, that... Are you trying to do a weird <laughs> newscaster voice? I was trying. I, and I, I abandoned it real quick. <laughs> it's it's real bad. <laughs> uh, that was... Mm, a movie that I've like never that. seen before. And... Me neither. Knew that it qualified for the show just from the little bits of this movie that I did know. Uh, so this was uh, this was a surprise. Um, but I gotta say, I, I welcomed one. I guess we'll get into that when we get into the movie. Uh, but first off, if you, if this is uh, your first time tuning in, thank you for joining us. And if you're a returning guest, you already know the deal. Uh, Mally over there and I, we like to watch movies that, in, in a similar fashion to Network, where uh, things aren't so uh, rosy at the end of the movie, where things are a little glib, yes, uh, a little dark, uh, sometimes even a little just confusing and like crazy. And this week, it's a little upsetting because it hits pretty close to home. Um, not just for you the fucking think. <laughs> well, we'll get into all that as well. Uh, but before we do, we should just let our uh, listeners know that we have a special guest on this episode. Uh, joining us yes. to talk about uh, this classic film network is special guest Jenny Lee. Hi. Hello, Jenny. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Mally. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I guess we, I mean, that probably gave it away, but we are still recording remotely uh, because when we're recording this, yeah. we are still in lockdown. <sighs> um, I'm having such a good time not being able to leave my house. <laughs> Um, so I'm kidding. I'm fucking losing my mind. <laughs> Jenny Mallow was. I telling like me, it. <laughs> yeah, I have no problem with it either. I come to really appreciate solidarity a lot more yeah. than I already did. Okay, like it's not. The, I just want to like go to Target without a worry. You know. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely been a hassle when it's like when I'm cooking something and I realize, oh no, I forgot to buy a lemon and I can't just run out and get a lemon and come back it's like yeah. well guess there's just no lemons in this <laughs> yeah yeah i mean and it like, has on, like, setbacks, a hazmat but... suit to go get some milk <laughs> it's upsetting well if you were to have all the props from this season that you wanted you'd have plenty of hazmat suits apparently i know i'd have like two it's great yeah. but jenny what i was gonna I'd say wear is both all the time when i told malibu we we're gonna do this movie he mentioned that you'd be interested in uh joining us so is there a specific reason why network called out to you because last week, um, I was in a meeting and people were talking about it and I didn't know what it was, so it felt like a good time to watch. <laughs> that, that's a good enough reason as any, I guess. Yeah. Wait, so none of us had seen this before watching it for this episode. Oh, really? Yep. yep. Awesome. That's great. <laughs> Fantastic. This is going to be a great episode, guys. <laughs> so it's, I guess it goes without saying then that if you are a huge fan of this movie, and, you know, we skip over some things that you think are important or downplay some parts that you think are worthy of a little more recognition. Just give us give us a leeway. This is, you know, one of the classics that I finally just got around to seeing for this show. Uh, and I do have a lot of positive things to say about it, some good things. Um, but we'll get into that. So I guess we don't really need to do like a roundup of what our relationship is with this movie since none of us have seen it before. Um, I had never seen this until about four hours ago. Right. <laughs> so because as per usual, I waited until the very last minute to watch the movie of the week. <laughs> so with that, why don't we jump into uh, some details regarding the movie Network? So as I said, the year is 1976. Uh, director is Sidney LeMay. This is our second Sidney LeMay movie. Uh, after... Yeah, didn't he do uh, Dog uh, Dog Day Afternoon? Yes, he did. Which Sick. We, not too long ago in our uh, catalog. So, Sidney LeMay becoming very popular on this show. Uh, the film stars Faye Dunaway, William Holden, Peter Finch, Robert Duvall, Wesley Addy, and Ned Beatty. 
The budget was $3.8 million and managed to gross $23 million worldwide. Uh, it currently sits at a 92% on Rotten Tomatoes and has a bevy of awards. Uh, I'm just going to run through these real quick. Uh, it's number 207 on IMDb's top 250 movies of all time. Uh, it's the winner of four Oscars, including Best Actor for Peter Finch, Best Actress for Faye Dunaway. Be higher than that. Uh, number two hundred seven. Yeah. Um. I yeah. mean that that's still. I mean, out of two hundred fifty movies out of all time, two hundred seven is not bad. Yeah. It, I just it, assumed it would be higher. Well, you know, since the the twenty first century started, there's been a lot of movies that have jumped in. Like Dark Knight is like number three. Which, not to take away from Dark Knight, but that's like... That's kind of weird. That's yeah. really one of my favorite movies, but I don't think it's number No, three. I don't either. I, I mean, you have the problem of, you know, the internet being vented around a time some of these movies were popular and new, and is therefore the you list, have more people. The, the internet like... was invented, Dustin. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, clearly after Network, so that would explain why Dark Knight's above it, but... Touche. You know, that's what, was, that's what I'm saying. It's just, there's more... Every, everyone knows the internet was invented in 2008. Yes. Right? <laughs> when the Dark Knight hit before that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah. Winner I'm of pretty four... sure that was part of the Dark Knight's viral marketing, was they just invented the internet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Winner of four Oscars, anyway. including Best Actor for Peter <laughs> Finch, Best Actress for Faye Dunaway, Best Supporting Actress for Beatrice Strait, that's uh, Max's wife, uh, Best Screenplay for Patty Chayefsky, and was also nominated for Best Picture, Best Actor for William Holden, Best Supporting Actor for Ned Beatty, Best Director for Sidney LeMay, Jesus Best Cinematographer Christ. Owen Roisman, and Best Editing for Alan Haim. And I'm not going to bother reading off all the other plethora of awards uh, that it's won. It's also a lot of nominations for people who were not on screen for very long. Right? Yeah, I mean, wait. So his... Uh, what's his name's wife? Max's wife yeah. won an act, uh, won an Oscar for best supporting actress. All you She's need on the is screen one, for like three minutes. You just it's... need one really great monologue about respect and allegiance and yes. your great winter romance. And uh, I mean, there you Ned go. Beatty was also nominated for an Oscar, and he's on screen for like three minutes. He's the the guy giving the uh, the uh, forces a, of nature really... speech. Yeah, he's got yeah. A, a good one about the primal forces of nature. Both so those actors if you get offered, have great speeches. Like, <laughs> so if you get offered like a bit part, but it has a like, monologue, take it. <laughs> for real. Yeah. You never know. You might just get nominated an or win an you. Oscar for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Before we jump into the film, uh, I've got a trailer for the movie that we can watch and listen to and get our reactions to. But, I mean, of course, this is 1978, so trailers aren't uh, what they are nowadays. It's a little long. But it is... Is it worse than the trailer for Terminator 2? No. Okay, well, we're fine then. You'll just see. There's there's a gimmick to this trailer that will uh, become very apparent real fast. So why don't we watch the trailer, we'll talk about it, and then we'll jump into the movie. And now, the distinguished television news commentator... Mr. Howard Beale. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like at this moment to announce that I will be retiring from this program in two weeks' time because of poor ratings. Since this show was the only thing I had going for me in my life, I have decided to kill myself. I'm going to blow my brains out right on this program a week from today. What the hell's going on? Prepare yourself for a perfectly <laughs> outrageous motion picture. Howard Beale went up there last night and said what every American feels, that he's tired of all the bull... Six, Diana, we're talking about putting a manifestly irresponsible man on national television. I am not putting Howard back on the air. It's not your show anymore, Max, it's mine. <laughs> I got a feeling I'm being made. You are. Got to warn you, I, I don't do anything on my first date. We'll see. I want a show developed based on the activities of a terrorist group. Well, I'm mad. So I'm going to make a TV star out of you. Ooh, Just chicken. like yeah. Archie Bunker. He's a vegetarian, too. We're the number one show in television. The actor? Yes. There is no America. There is no democracy. There is only IBM and DuPont and Exxon. 
<laughs> and you <laughs> have meddled <laughs> with the I know it's coming. forces <laughs> of nature. And you will atone. Am I getting through to you, Mr. Beale? Why me? It was your own television, dummy. Ladies and gentlemen, the Network News Hour with Howard Beale. How long was this trailer? Seventeen minutes. Jesus We're Christ. We're about three fourths of the way right through now. it. We're watching. <laughs> the We're just watching the movie. Open it. Yeah. And yeah. Stick your head out and yell. I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. Things have got to change. How many stations is this going to get mad? Excuse me. There it is. <laughs> Yeah. I want you to get up right now. Now Clearing it's just like a windows, minute of credits. Stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. Are they yelling in Atlanta, Herb? Are they yelling in Atlanta, Ted? I'm mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> Network by Patty Chayefsky, directed by Sidney Lumet, produced by Howard Gottfried. Television will never be the same. So yeah, that's the three minute trailer. So I've seen this movie twice now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they do kind of just cherry pick all the best parts, and that was yeah. long. Yeah, Good um, Lord. that no, that was three minutes on the dot. Holy hell! Yeah, I. I think it's pretty insane that they would allow in 1978 for someone to talk about blowing their brains out in a movie trailer. Uh, it seems pretty crazy I don't in terms know, of man. Like, it was standards. The 70s. It was the Shit 70s. Was, I, I yeah. guess. I mean, I just know the FCC and everything. I, I don't think know. you're getting the 70s confused with the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> That's maybe a good point. Actually, when was the FCC started? That might be a good question. Well, it was uh, definitely around then because they reference it in the movie. That is mm-hmm. very true. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah, the Thunderbolt graphic is great. <laughs> we had no restraint for uh, gimmicks back then at all. Um, I and I do still don't think we have much for it today. That's a good but point. Okay. <laughs> I, I do like the, the tagline, though. Speaking of gimmicks, for all interested parties, on this week's episode, I will be eating. Oh cookies. boy, what's Molly eating? Cookies. Uh, Did you make the cookies? coconut what kind almond? Of cookies? No, they're store bought because I was lazy. Um, coconut almond chocolate chip. All right, they're what's delicious. The, you want to promote the brand? <laughs> nope, because I can't remember what what brand it was. Okay. This is a, a, a recurring segment, Jenny, if you were not familiar. Mally I likes to eat. I was not familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do like the tagline. I'm not allowed to eat I... peanut butter sandwiches on air anymore. God, no. <laughs> God, no. <laughs> it was so good. You don't understand, sir. All right. Let's let's you jump into... My peanut butter choice, asshole. Jump into the film. Uh, there's, there's a lot of ground to cover. Uh, I guess we should start with what the legacy of this movie is because it seems to me based on the research I did that Sidney Lumet and uh, Patty Chayefsky, the director and writer of this movie weren't intending to make a satire of how we interpret news and how we interpret television. But in the coming decades, it seems like this movie has almost become real to life. Like I, the part that that sticks out to me is, you know, uh, when Howard's talking about he's going off the air because of low ratings. And the first thing I think of when I hear the word ratings now is the president, because that's all he seems to want to oh, talk Jesus about. Jesus Christ. I mean, I don't want to get political, but this is exactly, this movie kind of predicted exactly how we deal with news networks now. Everything is about clickbait, and everything's about ratings, and getting you to stay tuned and st- you know, stick around, don't change the channel. And it's just interesting that they weren't intending to make it satirical when they made this movie. They were just trying to make a a compelling movie. I mean, what I think is so fascinating is that it, you know, it came out before the launch of CNN, which was, you know, Mm -hmm. is widely considered the beginning of the 24 hour news cycle. And so the idea that like, that there is a, a one, one, like a few hours every night where people are getting their news and that, like, you could focus it all in that that little package versus 
the constant onslaught. Um, yeah, it's a uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sybil the soothsayer really knew what was coming. Yeah, I mean the inherent problem with twenty four hour news networks is you run out of news kind of quickly, and then you have to fill it with you know opinion shows. Uh, you have to. I'll just fill it with all the bad news. You you don't rarely, I mean, you rarely get any of like, here's the the good news. The you know just the going ons. It's just always you know this you know this drug will kill you. Don't take it. Or you know mm-hmm. here's what the left is doing. Here's what the right's doing. And See, I I love like the slow news days though, because like you know I get all the CNN updates and whatnot on my phone. Mm-hmm. I love the slow news days because I'm just like. They're just sending out weird notifications now. Yeah. Just like, like, hey, check out this video of this duck. Yeah. Okay, CNN, <laughs> there's something else you could be reporting on. I'm fucking sure of it. I mean, that's why I tried I mean, to the get... The duck video was adorable, but <laughs> that's beside the point. I mean, even like when you look at... Are, am I allowed to talk about plot points yet? Yeah, go for it. Okay, yeah. so like when she when, there's no structure. To the <laughs> there's show. no structure to the show. When Diana gets like the when she first you know sh- pitches the news footage of the uh, the terrorist group that are like you know like robbing the bank, like the fact that they don't immediately run that, you know, she's like, wow, this is amazing. The fact that they weren't like, well, we have to put this on this, like we have to put this on yeah. the air now before someone else gets it or like before it ends up you know leaked. Like they, that's not even. It's like, I, I mean, can't it's like to build 60 a story minutes. around it. They're yeah. like starting 60 yeah. minutes right there. Yeah, I mean, just to... It's so funny, like, looking back at stuff like this, because you could see everything was in its in its slot. Like, here's the world news, here's sports, here's weather, and we're out. And that was pretty much it. And now they're, you know, Diane is pitching this crazy idea of a limited series on something that's very important, which I do got to say... um, Based on actual events, because I don't know if you guys are familiar with the story of Patty Hearst, but they mention her in this movie, and then oh, there's course. the fictitious, uh, I can't remember the name of the other girl that gets basically the A same. A different heiress. Yeah. Basically the mm-hmm. same story run twice. But yeah, for those listening, if you don't know about Patty Hearst, it's a very interesting story. And in fact, I think Drunk History did a segment on her. That was the... Um, she was the daughter of uh, Rudolph uh, William Randolph Hearst. And there you go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the subject of Citizen well, Kane. Also, like one of the first lines of dialogue in this movie, in the very opening, is fucking talking about the um, when what's her name Squeaky. I don't know the chick from the Manson family tried to assassinate Gerald Ford. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that was awesome for me because I was I have been because you reading, love Manson. I, I love me some Charles Manson. The dude was a fucking idiot. But that's all that's a different podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um but that for me I was like, "Oh shit. Nice." And that's all I really have to say. Yeah, they do Moving a on. lot of <laughs> little things like that to kind of ground you in what specific time we're in. Right, and, right. Yeah. I do like that they don't come on. I don't think they even say like a specific year or anything like that. I mean, they might, but I don't recall. It's possible. I don't remember. Yeah. No, I guess so. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say, going kind of jumping back, not necessarily discussing the plot of the film, but to me, I don't know if this is true for you guys, but for me, that was is this like one of those movies that like like it's a classic movie, no doubt, but it's like I feel like it's one of those movies that everyone knows about, mm-hmm. but like a lot of people haven't actually seen. Like I feel like The Godfather is one of those movies. Like everyone knows The Godfather. Yeah. Like, I was very much familiar with, like, the pop culture, uh, like, ramifications from, you know, like, even, like, the I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Like, that's used in, like, TV, that's used in commercials, that's used in other films. Like, that that whole breakdown, that that's all very familiar. But I truly had no idea. I thought this was going to be, like, a fun newsroom romp. Yeah, I was gonna it say. I thought I thought we were doing some like new, like some Sorkin newsroom, yeah, some me spotlight, too. like getting into That's like a I spotlight thought. type movie, maybe. Even. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I was wrong because I, I thought I, it was. Yeah, I, love I think me in and, my head, I might be confusing this movie with Working Girl. <laughs> <laughs> what? I, no, I. That's. I thought it was gonna be wait the Dolly Parton movie. 
No, the like rom com with Melanie Griffith and Harrison Ford and Sigourney Weaver. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I I thought it was gonna be far. like a like a like yeah like a Sorkin newsroom kind of thing, but like kind of bottled, where like it's just these characters interacting on like uh, you know an average night on a news station, and then one of these characters. Uh, the only thing I really knew about this movie was the Mad as Hell speech. That yeah, and now, I will say this movie walked so Sorkin could run. Yes, <laughs> like, Sorkin is definitely out of by this stuff. Doubt. Yeah, I mean the only thing he really added to it is people are walking instead of just standing in a room talking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, now I, I want to watch The West Wing. I, knew I that. always watch The West Wing, but I mean, I, I mean Sorkin. The, uh... I mean Sorkin. You know, has a almost like an homage to this in the first episode of Studio sixty on the Sunset Strip when. Uh, what's his name, like, has his full breakdown and, like, gives this a similar ranting speech mm-hmm. on air. Oh, shit. Yeah. I would I, recommend I, I haven't really watched that show, but I do know, like, that it's about the... Uh, I know that it was similar to how Network is, so maybe I'll have to check that out, too. Um, but yeah, I, I guess this movie wasn't what I thought it was going to be, but at the end, I no. wasn't... You know, I wasn't dissatisfied. I liked what I got. Yeah. Yeah, uh, this this movie got a lot more like bonkers than I thought it was going to. <laughs> I mean, that yeah. third act alone Towards is the end, crazy. It really yeah. just spins out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's weird because like a modern version of this movie would. I mean, the pacing obviously would be probably picked up a little bit more, but like that whole middle section where it's just about uh, Max and Diana's relationship. Oh my god! Uh, like my notes throughout are literally like every so often. I'm like, wait. Why are they having? Why? Where's this like C plot about romance coming from? And like, yeah, why are yeah. they having a romantic weekend? Like, I don't. What's going on with Howard? I want to know what's going on. With I know, like everything that happens with Howard, you know, like they'll cut to they're in the control room and they'll be like, he's fine. He was like cracking jokes in the rundown. I'm like, well, why didn't we see that? Like, man, why did we have to watch? I mean, like, I loved watching Faye Dunaway eat whatever the whatever they were eating like pizza oh or something God, like a yeah. knife and fork it was like couldn't take my eyes off her but at the same time i was like what is this really why do i need to see her on this awkward date she has just unworld like unnatural otherworldly cheekbones like oh they are God. intense like i mean mm-hmm. it's it her face is so well like it puts together like the perfect like classical woman that i love that they kind of they made her like kind of the central character more so than Howard or Max of like, this is a woman in a quote unquote man's world and she's dominating. She's taking over. And I like, mean, also when, that's just how tight. I mean, that also shows how in the seventies it was where she has to like give a whole speech about how like, yes, she's different. Cause like, she's like a man. She's like, well, yeah. like, I had a, I had an affair with my therapist and like, I fuck like a dude. Like, yeah. And, like I, you know, like I'm like a man cause I care about my job where it's like now you would get skewered for for saying things like that because yeah. the idea that like work is a masculine trait, like having a work ethic, that's insane. Well, I just I love that they don't give her character the vulnerability of it all being too much for her. Like no, I like how she's she, she comes out and <laughs> not says in the slightest. <laughs> like that first scene, she's got that you know the the group that works underneath her. And she's like, I want to do this show, and everyone's kind of like you know looking at their fingernails, staring out the window, and she has to assert herself and say, look, I'm your boss. If you don't do this, you're fired. And, you know, she gives that speech to Max about, I fuck like a dude. You know, I'm so focused on my work. And then we get to see that in action. And as as kind of silly as it is, it shows her that she's not bullshitting. (laughs) She's walking the walk and talking the talk. So, Mm -hmm. And I, I do appreciate that when Max criticizes that, it's not from a sense of, like, you're a woman, you should be, because she says, like, you're a family guy, and, like, you're, you know, you're into, you know, you want, like, a wife and kids, like, that's fine, but, like, I don't want that, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And his criticism of her has nothing to do with the fact that she's a woman, has nothing to do yes. with her gender, has everything right. to do with her age, which, like, he's like, you're a generation of, your generation that's raised by television, like, that's different, and I did, a, I did really appreciate Well, that. Max puts everything through the scope of television, even when he's describing their relationship, he talks about it in a sense of watching TV. Like, he can't separate himself from that world. He talks about third act problems and everything but else. I feel like, but I felt like when he was talking about that, like, he was talking about that as he was, when he was telling his wife that whole thing, he said that 
that's how Diana is always talking about their relationship, that, like, she has scripts in her head of how it's going to work out. Mm -hmm. But it really, you're right, it does feel like he adopts that, because then later on he's like, well, like, here we are. I don't like the way this is turning. And she even says when they're having their big breakup scene, she's like, I don't like the way this script is going anymore. Yeah. It, I, a, a relationship I could not wrap my head around. Like, I could not empathize with either of those characters. And, I mean, I guess it's, maybe mature is not the right word, but the way they go about their relationship, both in the good times and the bad times, and even up to the breakup, is a lot more amicable than, I guess, most relationships probably would if they got to that point. I mean, an affair, you know, with an older man who's married, it could get a lot uglier than it did. And the he's fact that... He's not that much older. Like, I looked it up, he's 58 in this movie, but he looks ancient. Yeah. I mean, even 58, he's still pretty spry for somebody in the 70s. Like, I feel like 58 in the 70s is a lot <laughs> What do you have against the fucking 70s, Dustin? <laughs> Jesus. They, had, I, like, I mean, we they were... had doctors and medicine. No, no, no. They had, I... I fully get that but like the dietary restrictions and everything we were still you know red meat and wine and Incl- i'm pretty sure that's what max eats in this restaurant 58 is a lot different nowadays than it was then i mean look at any anybody that takes even a little bit of interest in their health and their longevity and they look different i mean he still looks 58 in the movie but I don't I mean, know. He looks like I, he looks have so old. Some I'm the ageist. opinions on shit. I'm <laughs> ageist. That's what it is. I hate old Wait, people. hang on, Dustin, because <laughs> this has been a, this has been a recurring trend. Mm-hmm. Um, so which unlikable character did you side with this time? <laughs> oh, hmm. Um, because Howard, based based off <laughs> other episodes, you take some weird stances. I take Howard's side. Everything is crazy, and you know that's better than your usual stances. So well, who would we'll, I? Who, we'll who else it. is there? <laughs> I don't fucking know. I figured you probably fucking sided with Robert Duvall or something. <laughs> Ned Beatty. Who Everything is, is a corporation. Great in this movie, by the way. Yeah, he's great. Duvall Why is he wearing is a tux at all times? Oh my god, I love the tux. <laughs> what? Yeah, uh, I, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm a, spoilers. My prop cop this week is that fucking tux. <laughs> Dibs on the tux. All right, the tux is great. You don't need. You don't. It doesn't fuck because it, it was the '70s, Dustin. Fuck you. I mean, it's just everyone People else's wore suit and tuxes tie. in the '70s. You, to work every day. I don't know. He's always in a tux. Yeah. I, he's he's fancy. a classy gentleman. Look, I don't like being gay. You wouldn't understand. <laughs> Mister wears short shorts every fucking day of his life. I if I I would wear a suit if I had a reason to, but I don't. So well, if you lived in the seventies, you would have a reason to every <laughs> fucking day. God, I could not imagine living in that era where everywhere you go, you're in a suit and a hat. Oh, it just seems so exhausting all the time. I don't know. I couldn't do it. Lazy ass. Yep. So, this movie's oddly funny at times, too. Oh my god, it's so, it's like, so for funny. something that's so dark, <laughs> it was so funny. Like, Hilarious. I love whenever Laureen, is that her name, Laureen? 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 The, mm. the communist? When she was mm-hmm. screaming, <laughs> like, don't fuck with my distribution rights. Yes. And, like, yep. that <laughs> negotiation scene between the terrorist organization and the lawyers is so fucking funny when they are yelling about how like she's not gonna see a dime until they go into syndication like that was so well, funny even before that like when howard first starts like fucking losing it on air like no one's reacting that's my probably my no favorite part one of the movie. is reacting well that's that's when i knew instantly i was like i'm gonna like this movie because no one says anything it's just another day at the office and then that guy has to kick the door in and goes what just happened <laughs> that's what everybody yeah, that one lady's about. like uh he just said he was gonna kill himself like he, he what like it, it takes a minute clearly like it's just like it's just become such white noise to them yep that they, it just doesn't register like oh yeah no howard's talking okay that's exactly what i was like okay i'm in on this movie i love how yeah how they did that, that. that that was the exact moment where i was like okay yeah i kind right, of sat up right. in my chair and i was like all right let's do this yeah i was laying on my couch and i literally sat up i was like oh, okay all right i'm in i'm here for the ride let's can, go can we jump back this... a little bit further though to the beginning of the movie where max and him are having their drunken conversation out on the streets and then they go to the bar i don't think i've ever been as drunk 
as he told these two old geezers were <laughs> at the beginning you, of this movie. Really? Just in the streets yelling about uh, potentially jumping off the bridge and everything. The story that Max is telling is well, pretty I mean, funny. That story, I mean, I think that story, they he tells it more than once in the mm-hmm. movie. And I think that it's like supposed to be, y- you know indicative of the themes of the whole film where they're you know he's telling a story about from his youth where the taxi driver says like you're still a young man you have your whole life but then as the story goes on there are these two older men who are at the end of their careers they even Mm -hmm. talk about like you know when he when max is talking to diana during the breakup he's like i'm closer to the end and you know we're i'm looking at death through like with real uh what did he say oh god he had such good words there's such great words Oh, yeah, fuck. I know what scene you're talking about. You know, yeah, yeah, like yep. that scene where it's like, where it's like, where it's like, it's real. There's like actual um, implications to it. I can see what it's actually going to be like, and that's so different from you know talking about the beginning of their career when they have their whole lives ahead of them. And uh, yeah, so I thought that was, I thought that the I story mean, is supposed to be like a throwaway funny story, but I think it's supposed yeah. to, you know, it's a good juxtaposition when you cut from them laughing outside, telling that street to. They're in the bar, and Howard's kind of sulking with his head in his shoulders, like, just on the bar. Like, it tells yeah, you guys did have the rest of your life ahead of you, and now you're at this mm-hmm. this breaking point. Uh, but I gotta ask, Mally, I feel like I know the answer for you already, oh, but no. would you watch Execution of the Week? Because <laughs> I oh think I God. would. <laughs> you think it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would tune in regularly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I watch that. I mean, dark, Which, but we're kind of watching it now. I mean, this oh, movie is known. Oh, that got dark. <laughs> <laughs> this movie is known for mm. its mad as hell speech, but I gotta say, I don't know if it's my favorite speech that Howard gives because I do like the speech that he gives a lot the first time he has his own show, and you know, he's telling people that he's not gonna tell them to write their congressman because he wouldn't know what to tell them, but you know, that they should be angry. And then I wish we would have got a cutaway scene to the white house. Cause he talks about how many thousands upon thousands of letters they would have got. I would love right. to have seen that. Like yeah, just, I, just a cut to like the white house mail room to yeah. some like fucking <laughs> intern. Just be like, ah, the envelopes don't stop. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be um, great question. Yeah. Real talk for a second. I'm gonna get real serious. Do you think Alex Jones watches this movie every night as he lays in bed oh, touching himself? <laughs> you know what's funny you mentioned that is they they did this movie on the podcast Unspooled with Paul Shear and Amy Nicholson, and they talk about how many anchors that either have their own show or like a part of like the regular news team, especially on like Fox News, how many people seem to misinterpret this movie. Like I think they said like Glenn Beck did a whole homage to it and completely misinterpreting something no yeah go figure yeah completely possible completely miss the point of what the actual context of this movie is there's so many different yeah different people that take this movie in the wrong way but yeah alex jones i would not be surprised you know what i'd be surprised if he has seen this movie honestly he seems like he does minimal effort in terms of his journalism so maybe he hasn't no don't call it, don't call it that don't call it journalism <laughs> but sean hannity definitely but has probably Dustin, seen this a couple times yeah. how else would we know about tactical baths <laughs> <laughs> or uh the frogs that are getting turned gay yeah he's definitely seen that work a couple of times yeah <laughs> um I, I think one of the most interesting things about watching that work is watching a story that was so pathetic about how we turn news anchors into celebrities and have in many ways butchered journalism from presenting facts into presenting opinion in a sensationalized way. They say sensational in this script. Like I was going to count and I totally forgot, but it's like probably a dozen times. (laughs) Well, Um, yeah, it's, it's crazy to me that they're, this movie is showing people in the news business having that revelation that opinion based uh rants basically is versus like actual news it's you know it's upsetting that real life has gotten to this point like i don't know it's it is distressing for the characters within the movie but then it's distressing as a viewer of the movie that like yeah this is exactly where we've gotten to that it's hard 
distressing is an understatement for how I felt after watching this movie. But like, yes, I feel like the I feel like a lot of journalists watched like half this movie and then turned it off. for like, oh yeah, no, I get it. I cool. (laughs) But I mean, they 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 watch how it how it ended. They didn't make it that (laughs) far. (laughs) It's like when you're watching the Devil Devil Wears Prada, like. The first half, you're like, fuck yeah, Meryl Streep. But then by the end, you're like, no way, I shouldn't have rooted for no, her. No, I am nope. still on the, no, I am still on Meryl's side in that movie. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what, what, Mally? What, what? Uh, now that, now that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> explains um, quite a bit, actually. <laughs> someone we haven't really talked too much about, but can we talk about Peter Finch? I mean, Howard Beale is kind of the ultimate tragic character in this movie. But uh, for those who don't know, he did pass away before the Academy Awards took place, uh, and he was nominated for Best Actor, which he won uh, posthumously, uh, being only one of two actors that have done that. Second, we've also come around this movie. Yep. Heath Ledger for The Dark Knight. So, I I mean, Peter Finch really wanted to do this movie. Like, when he read the script, he even called up Sidney Lament and said he would fly himself out from Australia, which is where he's from, and uh, pay for his own He's airfare. He's Australian? He's Australian. You can hear his accent start. There was one speech he was giving when his accent started to sort of come out. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, I can hear that. I want to say when he was yelling, when he does the I want you to get mad speech, his accent starts to come out in the very, very beginning. Because I lo- I don't know why I like love when yeah, I actors' that- accent, like true accents come out when they're like really passionate in an acting yeah. scene. Because I think it's I think so they funny. Said they- they did that speech in only two takes as well. His mad as no hell shit. speech. Wow. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he he offered to fly himself out, pay for his own airfare, and Sidney Lumet was like, well, you're Australian, you can't do the accent and everything. And so uh, Peter Finch read the New York Times, like just a page of it in a uh, New York accent and got the part for it. Uh, which, is, you know, it's kind of poetic that as much as he wanted this script and to be like wanted to be in this movie and enjoy the script that he did get it and ultimately ended up winning best actor for it it's pretty nice that you know unfortunately he passed away but to go out on top like that not a lot of people get to do that i mean in no, heath ledger sad, as well Austin, now you're sad we watched you watched that movie four hours ago and <laughs> i don't now know you're if you sad. uh been all this I podcast had time before. to recover i ate cookies <laughs> Which are gone now, and uh, now I'm more sad. God damn it! <laughs> yeah, um, I don't have too too much. I mean, much of the stuff I have we already covered. Is there anything you guys? Jenny, want to I know you took notes. What you got? I did. I took six pages. Of yeah, notes. I had a lot. Oh of my time. god! <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is another like recurring theme of our show. Our guests are better at this than we Way are. Way better. <laughs> so, I mean, no, hand, handwritten I'm notes. A, I'm gonna. I'm no, gonna. I I'm a, I'm okay. A, oh, thank yeah, God. She's not. A, this isn't the '70s. Dustin. I thought she was a. I was going to say you're a monster. So, for I'm, I'm going to kind of put Jenny in the spotlight here. <laughs> oh, no. I got a text from her, and she was like, "So I watched it once and took notes. I think I'm going to watch it again in the morning. Do you think that's enough?" And I was like, "Uh, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. haven't even watched it yet." Jenny, I'm going to let you know there and are then, some times where Mally doesn't even watch the movie, and we do. <laughs> well, on. yeah. When I've seen the movie 28 fucking times, <laughs> um. And then Jenny again okay. sent me the script. She's like, "Here's the script in case you need it." I was like, "I'm not going to read that." <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate that our guests come on with such passion and I such, know, it do makes, so much research. It makes well not so much Dustin because Dustin does everything but it makes me look horrible. Yeah, you, you don't know, do shit fine. for this, which podcast. is <laughs> fine. You know, when you like, you don't. Like I said, I appreciate the Miranda Priestleys of the world, which means you show up prepared for stuff. Uh, uh, no complaint for me, Jenny. That's all Mal. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, is there anything uh, we didn't um, cover already? I mean, I don't know. I mean, look Jenny, through, we've worked together things... in the past. You should know I don't prepare or do my job very well. <laughs> you're, you're, you're fine at your job. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> uh I I don't know. A lot of my notes are like, this is fucked up. I'm like, ugh. This yeah, is there's up. a oh, lot of my notes like that, too. One of them. Um, oh, yeah. Like, one of the things about Howard is the question, like, is he really mad or is he right? Because his words are really meaningful and they have a, such a, like, you know, they have a ring of truth, especially when you think about today and how people are so dependent on television. When he's shouting at his audience where he's like, you only get your truth through the tube, you know, like, 
everything you think that is real is through the tube. And like, I'm sitting there watching this, you know, I mean, I understand that we're in quarantine right now. So like everyone's watching way more TV than normal. Probably. I mean, not probably definitely. Yeah. Um, but that, that those are all, that's all true. When he shouts about like the conglomeration of, you know, media tycoons and how the mess, how like media is taken over by very few people. I mean, I shouldn't talk, but like very few people in positions of power. Like <laughs> it's, those are all true facts. Those are all true yeah. statements. And like, Jenny's going to get us in trouble for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> going to get myself in trouble. It's fine. Um, but it's like, those are things, those things are true. So even though he's portrayed as having like a full mental breakdown, like, is he really, or is, is he actually truly just sick of the bullshit? And I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the problem like, with he's that. having a breakdown, but he's making some good points. Yeah, it's... He's making some good points. And it's like the nature of madness, which I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are feeling right now where when you look at Fox News and it's like, I don't understand. Like, are you not like, do you not see facts? Like what is happening? And, you know, it feels like he is going through the same thing where, you know, you're like losing your mind where it's like, are you people not paying attention to what's happening around us? Well, it brings to mind the fact that like, you know, the Howard's whole the whole reason, like, he, I mean, he's making sense, but it's the way he delivers that information. He's he's literally ranting and raving like a madman, so you have to take the theatrics with what he's saying, and sometimes one outweighs the other. I mean, there's, put on, you know, Fox News, as you said, any single time throughout the day, and you will probably find someone ranting and raving like this, but I, I mean, I can't think of a similar personality type that is doing that on the other side that is spitting out facts and truth and giving you information like that. It's just, I guess it's that composure that really separates how people take in their information. That's like, a really good point. I mean, imagine if a, an Alex Jones type was out there talking about, here's what they're doing with your taxes. And, you know, here's all the times that, you know, this organization broke the law or whatever. Like, we don't really get that that much. I mean, the closest we have right now, um, and I hate to even mention her name oh God. in the same sentence oh as Alex Jones, oh God. is AOC. Like, she's angry and she's vindic vindictive, but she has a point and she's going after the people that a lot of people are too afraid to go after. And she's also out there, you know, saying, here's what's happening. Here's what you need to know. But you know, before There's her, a, I, I mean, can't but think. There, yes, it's all. There is also a difference between like a politician and like a news anchor, and I think that yeah. this, you know, when they talk about like you, tr when Diana tries to pitch turning the news hour. I mean, even the whole storyline about how the news program that was previously like an independent division has now been turned over to the network, which has been bought out by CCA, which is being bought out by yep. the uh, Saudi Arabian oil. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. like, I mean, I guess they use the word OPEC, they use OPEC, so OPEC, that they're all being yeah. bought out, like, <laughs> that they are now, like, an arm, they are the, like, a, they're becoming a propaganda arm, that's what turns, you know, what should be straightforward news into, you know, like, sensationalism, and we see this on all channels, all news channels, yeah. no I matter mean, what they are. Ned <laughs> and, Beatty says it best when he says the world is a college of corporations, and it's just like yes. that. Mm -hmm. The truth has never sounded so fucking gross. <laughs> that there is like, yeah, I, no, like there's only one holistic. Uh, there's only one holistic system of systems, one vast and humane, interwoven, interacting, multivariate, multinational dominion of dollars, and mm -hmm. that's so true. Yeah, dude, that scene is like. Oh god. Like I was sitting in my couch like I felt like I was getting screamed at. Yeah. You're in the principal's office. Like, <laughs> like I was like I literally like kind of like like I sunk into my couch a little bit. I was like I'm sorry dude like stop please. Oh my god. <laughs> but, dude, like, I, that I love that scene and like the oh, camera angle and, of the table oh, with the like way... the, the lights are all like a fucking runway up to him. Yeah. Oh yep. god. Oh, I love I love how long Terrifying. it takes for him to get to that too. He's got to walk to the other side of the room, close the curtains, like straighten his tie. It's so good because it's it's a performance. Like he's well, yeah, and like he's like super like fucking like biblical about it. And then oh, just at God. the drop of my head, he's like he's like, hur, hur. am I getting through to you at all? Yeah, the, the like, turn. Wait, what? <laughs> from fire and brimstone to you know concerning psychologist is pretty fantastic. Oh That's by far my favorite scene in the movie, hands down. It's so, so good. Beautiful. Yeah. Um. I started sweating while watching. <laughs> it's all. It is also like ninety degrees in Atlanta. 
But I think it was that scene. Yep. <laughs> Literal fire and brimstone. Um, yep. Yeah. I, okay, I thought you had both seen, seen this before, so maybe you would have had an answer to this, but I thought one of nope. the interesting things, <laughs> maybe someone else does, is if you, when I was watching in the beginning, I was like, wow, everything is so brown. Everything is brown and drab and, like, flat, and then as it goes on, they're, they sort of start introducing, like, a more brightly colored palette. There's a shift in pattern and color, especially around Diana as the movie goes on. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know what that means. I was trying to figure out what it means, if it's because she represents television and I don't know, like the the fantastical and like the dramatization of what's around you and reality. It's like reality is brown and, you know, TV is in color. I was trying to yeah. Think, did, did either of you notice I, I and think, have any thoughts about it? Well, I, I noticed that more color was getting introduced uh, just in general throughout the movie. Like um, when Howard does get his TV show, they put that huge stained glass window behind him. And, it, you know, it just shines through so much color. I mean, it, he's almost like a televangelist, like, on TV. Yeah. He's definitely he's, he's televangelist. preaching to his crowd. And, you know, Sidney uh, Met even said that the cinematographer of this movie starts off in a very particular way and changes throughout. So the colors and the wardrobe and all of that probably goes in line with that. But he wanted it to start off feeling very loose and free-flowing. That's why, you know... When uh, the opening credits are starting and they're showing the people in the the like uh, conference room going over yeah. what the story is going to be, the camera kind of sweeps over and it's very soft. And then as you go on, there's less and less movement of the camera. There's less angles. Mm-hmm. Everything's tight. Everything feels like it's part of the uh, the cycle of television. It goes from the free flowing form of just spontaneity to everything is locked down. Everything is in its place. Um, Ooh. Yeah, hmm. which I did notice. I really appreciated that. Be- that uh, best cinematography nom is getting a lot more yeah. understandable yeah. now. Yeah. Holy shit! Yeah, um, this is I definitely wanted... one of those movies that I'm gonna have to watch again. Oh, yes. for sure. <laughs> so totally different. Uh, uh, t- t- great t- totally at different. this podcast, guys. Great at it. <laughs> totally different uh, topic, but. I noticed something that I thought was a little funny. Maybe you guys won't appreciate it as much as I do, but... I feel like this is going to be weird and fucked up. <laughs> when uh, Faye Dunaway comes in to buy the newspaper, I believe this is the morning after Howard announces that he's going to kill himself on the air. She goes in to buy her newspaper, and did anybody notice the uh, the uh, vendor, the newspaper vendor? He's, he's pretty, no. it's pretty creepy to me, but just tell me if you guys feel the same way. See, so brown. But he just stands there well, and smiles. Well, it was the 70s. Well, they, uh, <laughs> you know, well, you I get those. I can't unsee that now, Dustin. Damn. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I, I don't know why. I, I off s- the record, that's what happens when you get local uh, experts. Local talent. <laughs> damn. <laughs> there was no direction Dragged. in that. <laughs> no, um, there's, mu- there's so much great wait. local talent all over the world. Yeah. So did she just straight up not pay for that paper? She did not. <laughs> she just grabbed it and walked out. <laughs> Were newspapers free in the 70s? I, yeah, I'm sure she probably, because she works there. They no, give them she out buys her, her newspapers like a man. You just take yeah, what you want without asking it. or paying for it. You just take it when you want it. <laughs> so what you're saying, next time I go to Kroger, I should just walk out. Yeah. I mean, if you do, if you... If you're a man you, about it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can sir, you need to pay for that. It. I'm a man. I'm yes. not paying for this avocado and this almond milk, you son of a whoa, bitch. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We said take newspapers. We didn't say anything newspapers. about food. That's why journalism <laughs> nah, dude, is done. No. She's a television Al- news person. She doesn't need the Almond milk newspaper. is the 2020 equivalent of a 1970s newspaper. <laughs> it's fine. It checks out. I did the math. <laughs> I let's, probably um, should pay for the avocado. Let's talk about some performances too. I mean, we've talked a lot about about Howard Beale, uh, Peter Finch, and Ned Beatty and everybody. Faye Dunaway and uh, William Holden playing Max. I found their chemistry so electrifying. Like this scene in particular, where they're flirting and they're first coming to terms on this affair, and everything was so crazy to me because. You know, usually in these scenes, you've got a lot of innuendo and stuff like that, but they just seem to one-up one another 
after every comment, and it was just, it was real intense for just a normal flirting scene, but, yeah, I don't know, let's, maybe, maybe we can have some in-context commentary on it. My in only reason tonight was a gesture made out of your stature in the industry. Oh, dear. And because I personally admired you since I was a kid majoring in speech at the University of Missouri. But sooner or later, and with or without you, I'm going to take over your network news show, and I figured I might as well start tonight. I, uh, I love her. I love I how confident she is. She's so confident. <laughs> I was in the audience. I had a terrible schoolgirl crush on you for a couple of days. See, but, like, I wonder if, if she's, like, genuinely on, flirting, or if she is, like, trying to play the part to, yeah. like, get him Well, that's off, a good like, point. Because oh, like yeah. that's how I that's how I that's how I viewed this, which is why later on when they're like actually together, oh, I was yeah, like, wait, no, what the I... fuck? I thought she was just using him, and you oh, know, yeah, like no, she's man, manipulating man. the fuck out of him right, right now, is she not? That's what I thought, but like you know, they end up together later See, when she can't get anything from way. him. I didn't take it that way. I took it as she genuinely was curious about what a relationship with him would get her, but not necessarily just like you know physical atonements like oh, here's what i will we'll get from you but like a romantic relationship and then you know i max, just don't i sorry go on no i was just gonna say i think i think max didn't realize what he was getting himself into that she was serious when she said you know i am just like one of the guys i'm here to get what i want and get out and i'm focused on my job and i think it was too much for him but i just no, don't now that know you any like 35 year old woman who is the head of network programming yeah. who would say to an older man like oh i had a school girl school girl crush and not be like knowing that they're manipulating it like that's yeah. a, like you know what like she's not dumb like if she'd be like that is definitely positioning mm-hmm. herself as a you know someone who is in a lower position of power she yeah. even says later she has like weird daddy issues and so she yep. is like projecting those onto him right now yeah that's interesting i didn't even even notice that until you pointed out but yeah i could see it i could see it that way too um it was interesting how she developed her character too because uh when she first got the job and she went to talk to cindy lamette about her character the first thing he said to her was i know you're going to ask where her vulnerability is uh there is none she's not vulnerable and so don't try to put that in your performance because i'll just take it out in the editing room (laughs) so (laughs) Hmm. i mean fucking love that it, uh, that's a interesting way to get a performance out of your, interesting. Uh, your your actor, but yeah, I I don't see Diane as very vulnerable at least until the breakup, and then you kind of see maybe she's taking it a little too she's she's too focused on but her career. That, like her, I don't think she's too focused on her career, but I think what's interesting about the breakup is like the breakup happens because her career is falling apart, and I think that when she is like grasping at him to stay it has nothing to do with him it has to do with like her world that she has built where like she's the most successful person and like she is creating the number one network like things are falling apart and it's like okay Mm -hmm. like here's this person who has been like you know he even says like infatuated obsessed with her like Mm -hmm. she has been very clear that she is not obsessed with him and does not feel the same way and she just wants that validation because she can't get it from her Mm -hmm. job yeah yeah, that's fair to say. I mean, this is pretty much just a fling for Max anyway. Like, I think he thinks it's going to be something bigger than it is, but, you know, then that's where we get that. he said he prays that it isn't. Yeah, and then that's where you get the the amazing speech from his wife when she's leaving him. Like, God, I, I love I, that speech. I just don't know what Max is trying to do in this movie. I mean, maybe he's doing the opposite, where he sees that she's the future and he's the past. And he wants to cling on to someone like that, and it just gets too I think much that's for him. Very true. I think that's. I think that's very much what he's doing. I think he's trying to cling to youth. That's why he, you know, goes after her. It's why when he's like writing, he talks about how he's going to write a book after he gets fired about the golden, you know, early days of television. Like, yeah, he he can't let go. I mean the 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 whole metaphor about age and its relation to TV. It, throughout the film is is really fascinating where they you know look at like this generation that's like what you call sentimentality we call like de- decent like human decency yeah yeah um no i just i their their chemistry together worked so well like 
And I, if maybe I miss I misread, but I think they didn't really care too much for one another either. I know yeah. Faye Dunaway had an issue with someone on set, and I thought it was William Holden, but maybe I'm mistaken. Um, no, she she more than deserved uh, her Best Actress win. In fact, have you guys seen The Morning After, which is a classic photo of Faye Dunaway the morning after she won her Oscar? So Probably. She, I think I know what you're talking about. So it's this photo here. I'm showing the... Uh, is it the, uh, is she like by the pool? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's apparently she had been partying all night and like did not stop. This is the next morning. She still hasn't gone to bed. She's still in her Oscar gown. And I just love the composition of the shot. I love her, you know, devil may care attitude as she just eyelined straight to that Oscar. It's a great photo. Uh if One you have keep in mind, Dustin. Yeah. Audio podcast, buddy. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll post the podcast. photo. I'll post the photo in the show notes. But also, I also I really like the uh, the newspaper down here in the bottom that uh, pays homage to her fellow co-star Peter oh, Finch. Shit. Yeah, it's it's a great photo. And like I said, I'll put it in the show notes. So you can take a look. But this is a very famous uh, photo. So I don't know. I just I really like this picture a lot. Um. Okay. Huh. Do you guys have anything else we can talk about before we get to? Uh, the wrap up, the silver linings, all that good stuff. Uh, I don't really have anything, do you? Mean? <laughs> no, I think uh, yeah. I think in that's your, it. In your twenty six pages of notes, <laughs> I think that's all I've got now. <laughs> all right. Well, why don't we uh, <laughs> recap the ending and we can talk about that? So, uh, Robert Duvall, uh, Faye Dunaway, in a tux, in a tux, uh, and a couple other uh, members of the news station have all agreed that. Howard Beale has become a problem, uh, noted by the fact that he met with Ned Beatty and got a talking to of a lifetime, uh, and they want to get rid of him because his ratings are slowly, slowly dipping even further than uh, they anticipated, but they can't fire him because Ned Beatty wants him on the air, so their plan is to have him assassinated. And yeah, now they jump to murder so fast, really fucking quickly. <laughs> I noticed that too. I was like, God damn, everyone's just casually talking about murder. It's just like, well, real we quick. can't fire him. We could murder him. I like it. Yeah. Casually talking like, about murder. And truly the only thing that is that they're taught when they're talking, the only thing that holds them back has nothing to do with like the morality, but they're like, well, what are our, obli- what are our financial obligations to the Howard yeah. Beale industry? If like he goes off the air and then they discuss it's like, the contract and like what happens in the you know if he dies and even then like the guy the network president who his name i can't remember right now like the only thing the, the one who objected to the exploitation of howard beale as like you know a show in the like using his madness as a show in the first place right, right. he starts to be like well like you know we're talking about a capital crime here and you think he's about to say something like i can't believe we're talking about this and his only thing is that the network can't be implicated like it's yep. still just yeah. like yeah. we just can't get like we can't trace it back to us well and only now, one I'm, person no, I say getting away with murder a lot easier back then yeah <laughs> <laughs> and only one person it out has there. uh it out there has the uh well with all to ask if there's any uh recording devices in the room <laughs> And Robert Duvall doesn't really give a straight answer either. So, I don't know. I I yeah. thought that something was going to come of that. Of like, oh, maybe they were being recorded and they weren't aware of it or something. But no. Uh, Howard Bill just gets straight assassinated by two shooters that were hired um, by the uh, the terrorists that were doing the show on. That's right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this this movie wraps up pretty quickly. It's pretty quickly. It's like, it was like, like I remember be- I kept pausing it cuz as I was taking notes and I remember looking and being like how is there nothing left? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, like it, during during the scene where they jump to murder in 2.5 seconds, like I was eating leftover mashed potatoes. <laughs> so, at first like they were like, "Oh, we could assassinate him." I was like, "Wait, hold pause." Hang on. And like I rewound. I was like, let me just rewind a minute. I'm sure I missed something. They they wouldn't just jump to murder that quickly. And I rewatched the whole scene again. I was like, oh nope, nope, they they do. Okay. Yeah. Yep, uh, they wow, they just really get into that assassination attempt real fucking quick. And so then yeah. I proceeded to finish my mashed potatoes. <laughs> so as as Howard before he gets a single word out, gets shot in the head immediately to no fanfare, no reaction, no Nothing Just from a, the crowd. Uh, the camera zoomed in. Camera dolly dollies in, almost running him over. 
before we uh, cut to that uh, switching room where there's all the different news stations going on and the commercials. I mean, just the poetry of Howard Bill's death being televised, being coupled with a commercial for cereal. Can't can't get more poetic than that. Um, well, like, dude, if this movie like came out nowadays, like there would be another twenty or thirty minutes after him. Getting oh, there killed. would have to be a wrap up with Faith There'd Dunaway's be, character. There'd be like title cards at the end, being like so and so was implicated in the murder. Like, yeah, all this shit. This movie, like, nah, fuck you. We're no, we're done. Yeah, you get no kind of epilogue at all. You have no idea what happened. So the movie ends with the death of a potentially mentally unstable man. Uh, just live broadcasted over over the airwaves yeah that's that's the end of network so uh before we get so that was fun <laughs> before we get into silver linings uh jenny mally and i have a newish segment that we'd like to do on the show called prop cop now prop cop is where the movie we just watched mally and i pick one prop from the movie that we would like to own for ourselves so Mally yeah, kind of I already kind of spoiled mine. Yeah, you already let slip. But do you want to remind the audience in case they forgot? I want Robert Duvall's fucking tux, son. All right. If I had that, I would record every single episode <laughs> of this podcast in that tux. Well, you could, and no one would know. <laughs> I know. I would wear that tux in both my hazmat suits that I got from Contagion and something uh, else. Yeah, I can't remember. I got a hazmat suit from another movie. I don't remember what it was. The though. standard. Not a scanner darkly, no. I don't remember. Uh, well, the prop cop that I selected is the stained glass window that's behind Howard during his TV show. I think that... I considered awesome. that. Yeah. Jay, um, is, there a, is there a prop you would like to own from this movie? Sounds like from Mally's Choice, it can be a costume. It can be wardrobe. I mean... It can be wardrobe, it sounds we, like. We've, yeah, it's, we've argued we're about sh- this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I consider wardrobe to be props, but yeah, if there's an okay, outfit well, that... Can I, it, they're I'll, not. They're I, not. I'll, I'll, <laughs> it's, it's not. It's not, Looks but Mally, fuck you. you should know. I know. <laughs> I, you know what? No. All right, I'm changing mine. Okay, Ooh. great. The bucket of fried chicken. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, nice. Okay. Because so I am just, Was that KFC? <laughs> It was KFC, right? Oh, it's KFC. Okay. So it's not good chicken. Yeah. <laughs> so what what prop would you like to I'm gonna or, get killed by outfit. like KFC assassins. <laughs> no. Look, all chicken and all fried chicken is at least fried chicken. Yeah. Um Touche. <laughs> if it were costuming, I love the boots and jacket she wears to Reddy's funeral. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like I literally made a That's note. Fair. I That's love fair. these boots. I love this jacket. If it's a prop, I hmm. One of the green desk lights from the Ooh, the from conference the table. room. Yeah, yes, that'd be good. I think that's All like, right. It was a beautiful piece. Okay. Not 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 to be a stickler here, but both of y'all picked set dressing. You're right. But, you're right. I know. I picked set. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But I mean, no one like what actual? Pro- I mean, prop okay. cop is a general term. What from fucking now on. prop? I mean, like it what really is? What props are there? I don't think there? we've like, ever actually picked a real prop. That's what I mean. Like what props are there? There's like the guns, which like. They yeah. look real lame. They yeah. seem to hold a lot of you need to pa- pick a newspaper. I know they hold a lot of papers. <laughs> um, yeah, it's fine. Uh, there's his it's like all fair game. suitcase that he packs when he leaves Diana. Yeah, it's he fine. We'll, we'll we'll take what we got. Um, the only bit of trivia: I'm fried chicken. I'm gonna eat fried chicken in a tux. I'm psyched. <laughs> the only bit of trivia that I have is. Uh, Sydney Sydney Lamette was openly uh, very angry about what movie he lost Bex, uh, Best Picture to at the Oscars. Do what was it? As I say, do either of you know what movie won the 1978? I clearly don't. Uh, a little movie called Rocky. Yeah, Sydney Lamette was furious that Network yeah. lost Best Picture to Rocky. Which I'm not sure how I feel about that. I think this is a better movie. Um, I think it's got more longevity than Rocky does, I've but never I also seen Rocky? that's that's fine. I I like Rocky, really, <laughs> but I like Rocky, but it's not the best movie. I think Network should have definitely won over that, but who's to say? Um, all right, so I think I would choose this over Rocky. I, I like I said, I just think this is a better made movie than Rocky. Rocky is still a good movie on its own right, but this one has the prestige i guess wait i just went and looked at looked this up 
Did you have there to look some... up Rocky? No, I didn't have to look up Rocky. I looked <laughs> okay. up what are the other like who the, what the other nominees were that yeah. year for other things. How Peter Finch won over Robert De Niro in Taxi Driver. Yeah. What I know. I, oh, fuck. And Hold Faye Dun and Faye Dunaway, yes, earned her Oscar, but won over Sissy Spacek in Carrie. Yeah. Beatrice Strait won over Piper Laurie in Carrie. Like yeah. and over Jody Foss. Look yep. at the Wow, yeah. network like really fucked over Taxi Driver. Network driver. sweet. Network yeah. sweet the Oscars. Um I I kinda hate network now. <laughs> I don't I think, know that word. I don't know. I like, like wow. Taxi Driver a lot, but I think Peter Finch gives a better performance than Robert De Niro does in Taxi Driver. But also, like, as great as I loved his wife's full speech, for example, like, could not tell you her name. And, like, I think yeah. that Piper Laurie and Carrie is iconic. Yeah. I mean, Sissy Spacek and Carrie, too, fucking amazing performance. Oh, my God, but... yeah. But Faye <sighs> yeah. Dunaway, I think, better performance. But, you know, Probably, I mean. yeah. All right. Well, let's get to the whole I'm reason. I'm indecided. The whole reason why we're here. Let's talk Silver Linings for Network. By far the part of this show we are the absolute fucking worst at. By far the part of the show I put the least amount of effort into, honestly. <laughs> if we're being real. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I forgot about this part. It's it's kind of the last thing I do. So do, It's fine. So do we. There, there's been times where I started the episode and I forgot to come up with one. So as we record, yeah. I have to figure it out. But um, this one wasn't too bad. Um, I mean... It's pretty rough, because there's not a whole lot of options. Everyone has blood on their hands at the end of this movie. Um, but the silver lining that I came up with does have to uh, deal with Howard Beale and his whole prophetic uh, tendencies. I came up with that the people know the truth, at least in terms of what Howard Beale was all about. Like, that first speech he gives when he's on TV with his whole, like, televangelist kind of show, he is speaking real truth, and people are into that. And I think he, I mean, he came out and said what he said about the network, too, when he said that they've been bought up by the Saudi Arabians and capitalism and all that good stuff that he was talking about. Maybe a man dying on live TV is the wake-up call that these people need to realize what's really going on in the world. I think Howard Beale was a martyr in that instance, and he will hopefully get the conversation going uh, in the world of network anyways, not in reality. But, yeah, that's what I came up with. Mally, how about All you? Right. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, Their ratings probably fucking God skyrocketed. <laughs> I knew it. I fucking knew that was going to be a silver lining. <laughs> okay, no, it's fine. I have a second one, if you're not happy with that. I didn't say I wasn't happy with it. I just knew that was what it was going to oh, okay. be. <laughs> um, well, I'll wait till Jenny goes, and then I'll throw out my second one. I don't want to steal hers. Yeah, I was going to say sure I know. Jenny, you, I Yeah, you don't have to like, have one. No, I'm, I can come up with one. Okay. So I came locked and loaded with two. Okay, well, good for you. Um... <laughs> Getting a little sassy. No, <laughs> you came prepared. You LA fuckers are really <laughs> sassy sometimes. Now that you, it's good to see that you prepared something for this. Yeah, he did. He did some work. You did. You did something. Um, Bravo. I guess <laughs> it's. I'm fine, by the way. <laughs> death by <laughs> death by cookie. Um. Ooh, silver lining. Um, I mean. Faye, Diana, Faye Dunaway's character Diana really paving the way for women in positions of power in media. Hey, Boom. there you go. It counts. <laughs> <laughs> um, my second one, their assassination plot, as far as we know, very successful. Hey, they, those two hitmen are good at their job. <laughs> yeah. All right. So that's not, not uh, <laughs> that's network. Um, Jenny, typically did you the say neck work? Did I say neck work? It's network. Like that's, I think that's the porn parody, man. Oh, gross. <laughs> um, the last thing we I'm, I'm typically... I'm proud of that one. Thank the you. Last, <laughs> the last thing we typically do on the show, Jenny, is uh, we like to offer, pe offer people a, uh, a double feature uh, side order. So... <laughs> 
basically, I'm ready for this. We <laughs> like to pitch very the ready idea for this segment. Oh, okay. So you're aware of the pick me up movie? I was like 15 minutes in, and I texted Mally. I'm like, I already have my pick me up. <laughs> nice. Okay. Well, then why don't you go first? Tell me what movie you well, think people no. should watch after they watch <laughs> Network. I have two. Okay. <laughs> So j- oh, you came prepared. So like a I triple did. feature, or like one or take one or the other. I mean, we all have the time. You can do a triple feature now. <laughs> there like, you go. She's not wrong. Yeah, right. like wrong. I saw that. I mean, I know this comes out in July, but I'm pretty sure we're all still going to be inside. Um, so as Mally will tell you, I am a uh, one would say enthusiastic yeah. Disney fan. Okay. Yeah, that's <laughs> one way to describe it. <laughs> sure. And. Um, I have one, my Disney recommendation would be uh, another movie about the news where Robert Duvall plays a media <laughs> mogul, which okay. is Newsies, Wait, what? <laughs> Newsies, where he plays Joseph Pulitzer. Oh, I have yeah. no idea what that is. Oh you never God. heard of Newsies? No. Okay. It's Christian Bale. That's a good, okay. that's a good pick though, because you got that connection of uh, being news related and you got Robert Duvall in there. Yeah, I no, like I really thought about that. Um, All right, and what's, what's your second your one? other one? <laughs> I'll wait for you. I'll let you guys go. Okay, and then we'll go with my other one because, like, my other one, my other one is one of my top five favorite movies, and I would be surprised if it didn't come up. All right, well, Mally, do you want me to go or do you got one? I'll go. Okay, um, I think I may have recommended this as a pick me up before. I don't actually know if that's true. I anyway. Okay. I'm going to go with another Robert Duvall flick. Oh, lots of Robert Duvall in here. I'm going to go with Gone in 60 Seconds. Ooh. (laughs) The Nicolas Cage version. I love that movie unironically. Dude, I I back that movie. That movie is That movie's so stupid, but so much fun. So good. So good. You get some Giovanna Ribisi in there, some Nick Cage. Fucking uh, Doctor Who is the villain. Some weird blonde Angelina Jolie. Yeah, Very weird. Scott Can. Mm-hmm. I like that movie. The movie's I'm fucking not, great. Let's do for a rewatch. Um, all right. Well, I'm gonna go with another movie that has to do with the news. Um, that anytime you talk I feel about, like you're gonna go with the one that I didn't pick because I thought it was too obvious. Maybe, but I feel like anytime you talk about movies that surround the news, yep. you have to talk <laughs> about Anchorman. You got yep. to. So <laughs> I, I love Anchorman. <laughs> That might be my favorite Will Ferrell movie. You that, put it on right after Network, and you'll have a blast. So that's your favorite Will Ferrell movie. It might be interesting. Might be. I mean, comedies. If we're talking just comedies, probably. Well, yeah. So like, I'm, I'm. It's Will Ferrell. I'm talking comedies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, it would be like I don't. I don't know if that's my favorite Will Ferrell movie. Mm, interesting. What? Uh, Tell the good nights. I feel like yours is gonna be Step Brothers. If I know uh, you, uh, that no, hmm. it's Talladega Nights. Yeah, Woo! Talladega Nights is really good too. But I don't know, man. Anchorman. You get Look, I'm the best Rudd. there is. I wake up in the morning, I piss excellence, and uh, <laughs> no one can hang with my stuff. Yeah, that's why Bally likes it. He likes all the one-liners. <laughs> and it hits home because while we record this podcast, I in fact do not know what to do with my hands. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say your pissing accents, and I was going to be like, "That's so wildly <laughs> In a inappropriate tux while eating cookies and pissing excellence. Uh, well, Jenny, you mentioned you Quarantine had a second is going one. great. <laughs> you, you mentioned you had a second one, and it was one of your favorite movies. So what? What else? Oh, should yeah. People so it's another. With? It's another movie that is uh, about spinning a news story and manipulating the audience, um, which what? It's, called, it's Wag the Dog. Wag the Dog? I don't think I've ever heard of that. It's Barry Levinson and David Mamet, starring Dustin Hoffman and Robert De Niro. Oh. Okay. okay. Yeah. I right. highly recommend. It's, another, it's a, another one that sort of has a, like could be it's a it's a comedy but it could be the ending could also be construed as like a bummer okay interesting okay we're gonna have to check that out yeah we'll, we'll check it out see how i honestly thought it was gonna be a ridiculous like disney movie <laughs> of some sort again no. you see the level it though wasn't. that mally and i i picked anchorman as my <laughs> <laughs> i mean i was trying to like think of a different connection could have gone with uh so, like, Sidney Lumet's ex-wife's husband right before him was Leopold 
Stokowski, who conducted the orchestra in Fantasia, so, like, also could have suggested Ooh. Fantasia for, like, a weird... Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> Even on the pick-me-ups, people do more work than you and I do, Mally. <laughs> I mean, his, I mean, his yeah, ex-wife's, his ex-wife's uh, husband right after him, I mean, was Wyatt Cooper, father of Anderson Cooper, who is, oh, as you know, also a, you know, news. who is a, yes, much more yeah. news. So, you know, I guess another recommendation, watch the news with Anderson Cooper. Right on. All right. Um, well, lastly, uh, Jenny did a deep dive. In this yeah. <laughs> I feel bad that we're wrapping up and we probably didn't even break it into no, that's those pages no. upon pages. We're good. <laughs> um, the last thing we like to do is uh, give our recommendation. Do we recommend this movie? Uh, Mally, why don't we start with you? Do you think people should watch Network? Hell yeah. Okay. <laughs> <Jenny>. <laughs> What? <laughs> well, I I don't know. I just usually expect like a little more than just a hell yeah. <laughs> you might as well be doing thumbs up, thumbs downs on here. <laughs> so, Jenny? Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't do a thumbs up or thumbs down in Dustin's an audio podcast. Well, I know. I'm saying the hell yeah is the equivalent of doing that. But anyway, well, you gave your you gave yours. Let's move on to Jenny. Hell Jenny, yeah. what do you think? Um, yes, I would definitely recommend it, especially if you are like me and you have been faking that you've seen it for many years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now we can say I've I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. I get the jokes now. <laughs> um, I would say for sure, uh, I think the movie does suffer from being a little less interesting than the sum of its parts, like as a whole. Um, but I do think it's a good movie. I think the performances are stellar. The dialogue's crisp. Uh, it's had this incredible turn from satire to almost being like a documentary. Um, uh, but it's definitely worth yeah. either a new visit or a revisit if you haven't seen it in a while. Um, but yeah, I'd recommend it for sure. I'm glad I can finally cross one of the classics off my list of movies that I know I should have seen by now and I haven't. So this show is helping me do that a little at a time. Um, but yeah, that's uh network from 1978. Uh, if you enjoy our show and you want some more, you can always check out our back catalog and our upcoming episodes wherever you listen to our show. Uh, if you would, please subscribe, rate, feedback, all that good stuff. Follow us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or join the conversation over on Reddit at reddit.com slash r slash silver linings playlist. Uh, clue for next week's episode, Mally, you have selected... Yeah next episode that we're doing so why don't you give us a clue for what we're in um uh, what's in store for us okay be- before before i give the clue um you mentioned our back catalog i just want to say i'm gonna kind of call jenny out again why <laughs> so when i asked jenny if she wanted to be on um this show she began listening to all of our back catalog <laughs> oh my god <laughs> and it has been and like keep in mind you she started at the beginning like Ooh, those yeah that's rough that's yeah those first episodes uh, are they're different rough. they're different they're for sure. and um not like all of them just like movies that I knew she's yeah. been sending me like updates about like dumb shit you and I have said oh god and i don't know about you i have no recollection of most of our early episodes you guys should point. like you should re-listen to your empire strikes back episode because if nothing else it is like so funny to listen to how excited you are for rogue one. Oh uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> i mean text jenny texted me was like so did you like rogue one i was like oh now i'm sad i i mean that was funny. i, lo- that I mean was i loved payoff. it but you know yeah <laughs> I, I loved it, was, it too it was fine <laughs> It was fine. All right, well. It's not my least favorite Star Wars film. We've covered that on this show. Yeah, we've definitely ranked Star Wars Um, a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, clue for next week. Um, Oh, also, Jenny has some thoughts on our Hard Candy episode. Oh, boy. That's neither here nor there. (laughs) I do remember that one (laughs) very well. (laughs) Yeah, there was there was some uh there were there were some hot takes during that interesting episode. conversation. Yeah, Dustin making the argument for no, why you should feel no, no, sympathy no, no. for the child molester is that's, a choice. Let the record show that is not 
That is not what happened. <laughs> uh, Dustin, the record is recorded. The record can go listen to it. Can be interpreted Don't try many to different argue ways, with it, man. It can be interpreted many different ways. I do not. Let me say it again. I can't. It's been it's been years, but I'll say it again. I do not stand oh, with no. pedophiles. Don't. <laughs> <sighs> All right, oh. what's the fucking yeah. clue for next week? <laughs> I love that you had to clarify that. <laughs> Give me a fucking Glad I could be here for that. <laughs> what are we doing next week? Yeah, what are we doing next week? It's your um, pick. So, all I'm going to say about next week's choice is that um, some of the most glorious mustaches put to screen in the past few years. Mm. I don't even remember what we're doing next week. Great. Oh my god, that's a first. Usually it's me that doesn't know. <laughs> I don't remember. But I'll take your, take your word for it. Uh, well, Glorious thank you. mustaches. Thank you so much, Jenny, for being on the show. This was a true oh delight. God, thank you. And this was fun. certainly brought some levity to the show <laughs> that uh, we haven't <laughs> seen in quite some time. We also yeah. have to get... She did research. Yeah. We have to get <laughs> more is... uh, female voices on the show. I feel like it's way too much just two guys yelling at each yeah, other. Yeah, no, there's been multiple episodes in the past where we really needed um I'm going to call out I it's noticed. one of my favorite movies of all. <laughs> yeah. It, mm. Jenny, did you listen to our episode on Blue Valentine? <laughs> no, I have not. <laughs> would have okay. been great to have you on that one. <laughs> yeah, mo- a lot of episodes would be great to have a woman's perspective cuz then you end up like conversations like we had with Hard Candy. But anyway, <laughs> thank you for that's, listening everyone. That's not don't put that evil on me. <laughs> Please tune in next week uh, where we're talking mustaches, I guess. Um, until then, thank you for listening. And as always, I'm mad as hell. I knew you were going to do it. I, I, don't, I knew you weren't going <laughs> to. Just left me out to dry. Yeah, yeah I knew you were going to do the thing. <sighs> Excelsior! 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 Oh, look at us!